Good morning, Hopewell. It's good to be here with you all, as always. Um, as you're making your way inside, uh, you want to come find a seat, and we'll get started with some worship. Maybe stand up if you're sitting already. You were ahead of the game. Thank you. <laughs> Church, you can have a seat. 
Can I say it feels good to be alive <laughs> compared to last week? Holy smokes, it's good to be with you today, and it's good to be worshiping my brothers and sisters. Hey, uh, for announcements, first thing, there was a, a typo in the bulletin. Lunch Bunch is next Sunday. Uh, so next Sunday, not the 13th. The 13th is the shower day, so uh, not the rain shower, but the shower people with present shower. Why do they call it a sh Is it because they shower them with gifts? Yeah. That's what it comes down to? Yeah. Nice. They need more of that for men. Um, I like gifts. Uh, uh, also, there's Christmas boxes in the foyer. Oh, sorry, lunch bunch. Please sign up. Uh, come, that way you can get an, uh, an estimate of numbers. Uh, if you want to hang out with the, the cool kids, don't go to the Chinese buffet because that's where the not cool kids are. Um, we'll be at the Chinese buffet. Uh, Christmas boxes in the foyer. Feel free to grab them, fill them out. You know the routine with the Christmas boxes. If you have any questions, Patsy's in the back. She can answer them for you. We have two areas where we just have a couple of little needs. Uh, a couple of them, actually. Um, if, like, if you want to join the worship team, would you, you mean? What? Would it, be, would it be okay if someone wants to join the worship team? That would be significantly more than okay, okay actually. There you that go. would there be go. absolutely <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> All right. So there's that. Um, two other needs uh, for the non musically inclined. First, we have uh, some copper piping in the basement that's got a little bit, little bit of a leak we, below the sink. We would love to not have to use shark bites or to pay somebody to come out and solder a couple little connections. So if you've got that ability to put a couple copper pipes together, do a little melty-melty and solder-solder, let us know. That'd be great. You can talk to Jonathan Sturgis. He'll, uh, you can wave your hand. He, uh, he'll, he'll help you out and let you know where to go and where to, where to make some connections happen. Let me make a connection so that you can make a connection. Uh, also, <laughs> thanks. Awesome. I'm feeling good today. I'm feeling good, man. I'm ready to go. Um, the, last, the last area of need that we have is for men's ministry. It's something that I've been currently leading. We need a, I would love to have a guy to come alongside and work with me, work with Brad from South Scipio, and help us just kind of take that to the next level. I'll just tell you, you know, I mean, it's just, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, we understand as a church that, that there is something unique about being a man. You know, women have a unique gifting call and role, and there's a unique gifting call and role that God puts on a man's life to step up take responsibility, provide, do the hard thing, right? And the world needs men to know how to be men, and the church needs men to know how to be men. And so um, the, we, we would love to see that, just take the next step of doing that, and that now, so taking manhood more seriously, but also like playing together well, it's good for men to recreate, like I want to go hunting and fishing and, uh, you know, do stupid things with you, that'd be great. It's an excuse to be a little boy um, amongst my brothers for my job. So if you would uh, like to help and if God, you know, and want to explore what that looks like, I would love to have a conversation with you about that. So again, if you would be interested in helping up and stepping with, helping with leading men's ministry, that'd be great. James is up to pray today. You know what I realized, James? You need a microphone, don't you? No, you don't. Just. I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's good. That's good. Amen. Well, would you all want to stand back up as we continue worship? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, oh worship your holy name. 
The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your your soul to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find to bless the lord oh my soul oh Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his soul regret 
regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. direction pull us toward you call us toward you and help us to follow you in jesus name i pray amen well before you all have a seat would you turn to somebody around you and say hello or hola or ni hao or whatever you'd like
Hey, uh, this is, you know, again, you see it in your bulletin, but today is the fifth Sunday, and we have a uh, tradition for us. On fifth Sunday, kids stay with us, and that is a good thing. It is, uh, and I know it's a more difficult thing, so we're going to be extra gracious to uh, our parents who have kids that are going to be wiggly. Thanks, Nicole. Um, but we do it on purpose, even though it adds a little extra chaos in our service, because we know that it is important in the life of ministry to have your kids with you at some point, right? It's good to spend time. They need to sit with mom and dad. They need to sit with grandma and grandpa and worship alongside of you with aunts and uncles. And too often in ministry, we just keep sending people to silos. That can be a good thing based upon your stage of life, but we need these intergenerational times. So again, kids, welcome. Um, if you need something to do, pester your parents. So unprofessional. Okay. Today we're going to be walking through the text of Genesis. I mean, we've, we've handled Genesis so far, the first 20-something verses, in a more topical format, which is uh, very appropriate to do at times. But we want to walk through the text today, and I just want to go through and point out some of the interesting and awesome things about the way God created and how He speaks about creation through Genesis, especially when you set it in light or set it against the other religions of the time and how they viewed creation and talked about it. And so today's a great day to get out your Bible. We're going to kind of walk through the text that way. It's going to be a different feel than the last couple, so a little bit more scattered, so we'll give up precision for breadth, but we'll get through the text and hopefully we'll end today with you being in awe of the Creator God and how good He is. Jumping right in, the very first sentence of the Bible is this, right? You all know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as I've already said so far in this series, and others have said, if you can believe this, the rest of the Bible gets a lot easier. Right? In the beginning, God created, and it says so much about what's going on. But I want to point out this word beginning there, beginning. And there are actually multiple different views, scholars that use on how do we understand this first verse and its relation to what happens afterwards. Now, the word beginning here is, is not necessarily a point in time, but a period of time. This suggests that the beginning is talking about is not a precursor to day one creation act, but it is a period of time that he's going to describe on day one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? And so this verse is best understood as a title or an introduction to the rest of the chapter. We see this a couple times, by the way, in Genesis, right? We see, we have the Genesis account on, in Genesis chapter 1, and then we get a re talk about creation, specifically men right, and a woman, later on in the chapter. So the, he's covering things a little bit topically this way, giving us an introduction to creation. And now, and I want to point out this word God here. Um, there are two different words for God used in Genesis, at the very beginning here at least, right? There's multiple names for God throughout the Old Testament. But the, when you see it translated G-O-D, that means Elohim. That's from the Hebrew word Elohim. Say it with me. Elohim. Look at that. You know some Hebrew today. Look at you. And then uh, when you see it translated L-O-R-D, Lord, that is Yahweh. You can say, say Yahweh. Yeah, oh, well, that gets so catchy. And that's for the kids, you know. Um, both refer to the same God, right? We understand that. And, but, the, but the titles bring out a different emphasis of the relationship. So, again, to um, a couple people, I'm dad. To a lot of people, I'm pastor. And to one person, I am husband. That's right. And I point this out to say critical scholarship, and we talked about this in week one, would note the difference. In chapter one of Genesis, it refers to God consistently. In chapter two, it switches to Elohim. And critical scholarship would look at that and say, well, that must come from one source, and, El and Yahweh must come from another source. No, we would say, no, it's the writer is using different names of God to emphasize different roles of God. So, for instance, God, um, Elohim, focuses on God's transcendent power, right? This is a big and mighty God, with, but a word spoke and the universe came into being. That's God's bigness and mightiness and majesty. When you get to Yahweh, that's the covenant God. This is the God who makes a special relationship with Abraham and his descendants to say, I'm making a promise to you, and I'm going to develop a relationship with you. So Yahweh, Lord, is that more intimate sense Right? The more covenant God versus God, the big one who just spoke and everything happened. And this is what I'd like to recommend to you. If you've never done it before, or if it's been a long time since you've done it, get, go do a Google search and, and 
uh, look for the names of God. And you'll get a lot of good lists. There's some good books and resources out there. And, and they'll often include, they should include the references of where they come from in Scripture. And it would serve as a very powerful and helpful series of devotions and just some Bible studies. If you just work through that list, uh, you know, and just El Shaddai, what does that mean, right? And you go through the Lord of hosts and you read the passage. And God has so many titles because he's so big and expansive, far beyond our ability to comprehend. But God gives us through scriptures a lot of bites of the apple to get this multifaceted, awesome appreciation of who God is. By the way, Cody and Amber, welcome. I just saw you. Welcome, you married couple of you. Oh, look at you guys. Yeah. Getting hitched. All right. All right. Sorry, got ADD moment there. Now, they, look, we're gonna, now trust me here, we're going to front load Genesis chapter 1, or, you know, the first day. Like, you're going to be like, man, Brian's time is going to get blown out of the water. It, trust me, we're going to spend more time on here than the rest. And I want to preach on this for a moment. Because I've just focused on the fact that, hey, God's brought here the names of God. But I want you to, I want to also draw your attention that God is the subject of the first sentence of the Bible. He's the subject of the first uh, chapter of the Bible. His name is used some 35 times in about as many verses of Genesis chapter 1. God, God, God. The book of Genesis is all about God, not about us. It's about God. And so from the very beginning, Scripture is about God and who He is and the emphasis is on Him. And this is vitally important for us to stop and note because our tendency as humans is to go to Scripture and first ask, what does this say about me? We go looking for the mirror. What does this say about me? Who am I? What does God want? For, or who am I? How do I view myself and interact with the world? And that's a good thing to ask. And in fact, it's a very appropriate question to ask. I would suggest to you it's not the first question that you ask. See, the very pattern of Genesis starts us off that God is the center of the story. So when we go to Scripture, the first question that we should be asking is, who is God? What does this passage say about his nature, his character, and his purpose? We've got to start by looking at him, looking outward and upward first. And once we understand who God is, then we can find our place in his story, right? We are the side character. He's the main character. Remember, it's the questions that you ask about life or about Scripture that drive you. And, and I bet if you stop and think about it, if you spent the last years of your life looking at Scripture, asking, what does it say about me? first, and not what does it say about God, I bet your devotional life will get a lot of spice up. You know, I bet you find some new insights and have some fresh appreciation for God and some fresh life if you said, oh, wait, what does it say about God first? And that was your first questions that you asked, because it helps you think differently about scriptures, about your life. Ask the question first, who is God? Scriptures unapologetically about God first. And I want to go, I want to take this one step farther, right? So, okay, we've got God, the creator God, used frequently. He's the author. He's the center of the story. We need to look to him. And I think if you look into our lives, if we look into our culture, it's, it, should, it should be no surprise to anybody that we see a lot of chaos, right? We see a lot of breakdown, a lot of things that would be deeply unpleasant for us who are trying to put the Lord, God, as the center of our life and everything in it. Might I suggest to you that there are really a couple handful of root causes that are stemming into so many different things. There's a couple foundational things that we've missed that are showing up in, in all different ways. And I think this idea that we have looked inward instead of outward and upward for truth and for meaning and for answers, that's the cause of so much of what's going on. We, we have been sold the message that to, to understand yourself and life, you look inward. No, no. You look outward to the community. You look upward to God. That's where you find your answers. Let me give you uh, an example of this. Let's look at like self-esteem or body image, right? Currently, we are told to have good self-esteem or body image. You get it when you like how you look, right? If I can look in the mirror and like how I look, then I have good self-esteem, right? Good body image. That's the goal, to learn to accept yourself and making sure that so I so what that does is it makes it so I carve myself into the image that reflects what I think is good, right? In all sorts of different ways. Instead, I say that's the wrong approach, church. We look outward. What does God say about me? It says, Man, I am made in God's image. And those things about myself that I cannot change, they're the things given by God, made for his delight. Kofs get big ears, big noses, and big chins. My ears were this big when I came out of the womb. And while it might have made middle school rough, I'm like, why? 
I don't know, God made me for this reason. He draws delight in me, right? So I learned to accept the way that God crafted me. The things I can't change about me, the things that just God made. And if I look outward for self-image and value instead of inward, right, the answers get solved. You go further, what about the things that you have control over, right? Well, I, like your weight or health. And I say, man, I have responsibility to care for my body. It's a blessing that God has given me. If I look outward, as God says, steward your body, it is a blessing for ministry. It's a blessing for life. It, take care of it. So I look that way, then I get things aligned right. If I'm like, well, what do I like about myself? Well, you know, either I go, I go on extremes. Either I got to have a six-pack, and I won't be happy unless I have a six-pack. Or I'm like, man, I don't care. I got a ring. My wife's not leaving me. So, like, I don't care at all. Let the weight come on. Let me eat some more burritos, right? No, like, if I look inward, then I'm either driven to, like, an unrealistic degree of, like, you know, appeal, or I just give up because really, it doesn't really matter, right? No, I need to look to God and say, what does he say about the things that I control? I need to be faithful with my body, to steward it well, to have a, the right type of attitude towards food or physical fitness and exercise, right? The same applies to dress. So oftentimes we, we ask the wrong questions of dress. We say, what makes me look good? What makes me look nice? You know, what makes me? And it's me, me, me. And that leads us to all sorts of problems, right? What does God say? God says, love your neighbor. I dress, I should dress in a way that says, how do I bless my neighbor, right? And all of a sudden, this whole issue of modesty gets taken care of. We were at a, a, a fall festival the other day, and I, my jaw, yesterday, my jaw just dropped. Here's a reasonably nice dressed lady, and I look at her kid, who's like six or seven, and she's wearing boots, like shorts that are too high for my taste, and she's wearing like a long sleeve flannel thing with like her midriff showing. This girl's like six or seven. I'm thinking, holy smokes, this is, this is, a, a mom who's instilling the wrong values of what, what she thinks looks good or what her daughter might think looks good. And instead of thinking, well, how do I bless my neighbor? How do I teach my daughter to love those around me and the way that they dress? Modesty is taken care of when you ask the right questions of dress. Does that make sense? And so, again, there, I'm just plucking one example out of many in a, a topic I don't talk about a lot from this, the pulpit. But I want to encourage you. When you look in the mirror, quit worrying about what you see and what you find valuable or don't find valuable. You ask the question first about your looks, your dress, the way you take care of your body. What does God say? How do I look outward to him, and how do I look outward to my neighbor? Does that make sense? That makes sense. All right. Sermon off, or a uh, soapbox off. Let me come back to the text here a little bit with you here. Genesis starts with drawing our attention beyond ourselves, putting God at the center of the story. He's where we look to consistently. And what did God do? In the beginning, God created. Now, the Hebrew word there is bara. B-A-R-A, -A, with some special little characters above it to give emphasis. And the, the interesting thing about this word created is that the subject is always God. Like, God alone gets bara. And when, when God creates, it's the idea of newness and renewing. So we don't create. We borrow God's bara. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Good old dad joke there. Um, you know, we don't create anything, right? God alone gets to borrow, we, and he borrow, he created at the beginning, and we steward and borrow his creation and manage it, right? And edit it and build from it. God is the one who creates, and it's amazing how God does that. We modify, and we're going to talk more about our role in this one. How do we reflect God's creation when we get to, in a couple of weeks, man's call to have dominion over the earth? I'm excited about that sermon. Just finish it up this last week. It's going to be a good one. But remember, when I told you at the very beginning, and this is, if you're going to remember one phrase from the first part of Genesis, it is this, what one creates, one owns, right? And God created the heavens and the earth. God borrowed them, therefore he owns them. He owns the heavens and the earth and all that's in them. And if we can get that truth seeped down into our heart in a way that it drives our lifestyle and our priorities, we've, we've done a big thing, right? We, our life has been transformed by the gospel. He goes on to say this, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now you notice the ESV uh, capitalized the S there in spirit. And that's an act of interpretation, right? We have the text, uh, Hebrews has no vowels, has all uh, capitals, no spaces, right? No punctuation. She gets a line of consonants and there's acts of interpretation on how do we, where do we understand it? How do we understand it? And they capitalize it because they're interpreting this as the third member of the Trinity. That is the Holy Spirit. And that's a good interpretation. 
The Old Testament, the Spirit is the term of God's outgoing energy. His creative and sustaining Spirit goes out. And by the way, His outgoing energy, His creative and sustaining power is what we see today. Right? The most important day in human, one of the most important days in human history, um, at least for us, isn't just the cross, it's Pentecost. Right? When the Holy Spirit comes down in a unique way to, be, to fill the believer and indwell them. That is a unique thing that happens in the age of the church. The miracles of Jesus were done by the Spirit. The empowerment of the church for ministry and transformation, both inside of us, the fruit of the Spirit, and through us, the gifts of the Spirit, or of ministry, that's given and empowered by God. God's Spirit is with you. The same Spirit that hovered over the waters, the same Spirit through which God also created the heavens and the earth, dwells inside the believer today. By the way, um, I want to point out the, the Spirit's here. The Trinity is, shows up in Genesis. The cool thing about Scripture is sometimes the authors are writing Scripture, inspired by God, speaking all words true, but not even all words they understand or the, the depth of the meaning, right? So when Moses writes this, this does Moses understand the Trinity at this point? Maybe, but he might not have. He just, he just is revealed by God, the Spirit's hovering over the water. But we see God, Elohim, who created them all, the Spirit hovering over the water, and then you have God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. And it's a safe bet that anytime you see God take on human persona in the Old Testament and interact with the world, that's probably the second member of the Trinity, the Son, incarnating before he incarnated, right? You know, little, little sample. All right, all right. He goes on to say the, the, earth, was without, was a, the earth was without form and void. Um, the Egyptian viewed the concept of when something was without form or void, it was non-existent. So it didn't exist unless it was organized and differentiated. So without, without God's work, the universe was unorganized, chaotic matter. And then he organizes it and brings order out of it. Um, this is the difference between a bug and a bug that's stepped on. Right? Like matter organized exists, matter unorganized, it doesn't really exist anymore. And this, this idea of ordering creation and bringing order into it, again, is one that God's going to call us to, right? I'm excited to get to that point and when we talk about our role. See, God's creative act, because we're made in his image, he calls us to mirror that and reflect that with his creation. So he orders the creation. Because, because things were chaotic, in fact, specifically the deep. The deep word here is referring to the oceans. The deep is called tiom. That's the Hebrew word there being used, tiom. And I note it for you because what scholars will do is say, well, tiom sounds similar to, not really derived from, but it sounds similar to the word tiamat. And if you're any smite players in the house, woo -woo, uh, you know tiamat as some like character in a video game. It's a, it's a god from the Sumerio Acacian creation myth. Again, this is a contemporary religion of the Hebrews at this time. Now, it says the Spirit of God hovered over the deep, the oceans. They draw a connection to Tiamat. Remember, critical scholarship would view, and non-Christians viewing the Scripture, view the Old Testament as being born from an evolutionary process, right? So they would say, hey, the Hebrews come on the scene. There's religions that must predate them. They're taking their creation myths. They're tweaking and editing and getting, you know, Genesis as we know it. So Genesis is the result of a process of evolution and adaptation. Where they say, no, nah, I don't think so. I think Genesis is inspired by God and spoken to him, Right? And the way they justify this evolutionary view of Genesis is by making connections. So they look, the word deep there sounds like a little bit like Tiamat. They must have hijacked it because the deep is the ocean. Tiamat's the god of the ocean. And so they find these moments of similarities in the story to say they must come from the same place. My suggestion to you is that there are some similarities in creation stories. There are. But the difference, that there's incredible differences, and the most important things about the story are what's different. They speak very different messages. Let me illustrate this, right? Again, I note this. Scholars say deep, ties us to Tiamat. This must be a, Genesis must stem from some way from this creation myth. Let me tell you the creation myth they might say it stems from. Tiamat is the god of the ocean, and she has a mate slash brother named Apsu. They give birth to the gods. And the gods give birth to creation, including people who act as the gods' slaves. Now, Tiamat and Apsu don't like creation. They don't like their grandkids, essentially. So they attack the gods and the earth, right? We don't like what you did. It's noisy. It's chaotic. So the gods and humanity fight against uh, Tiamat and Apsu, and they kill Apsu. And his, his corpse becomes the land and the foundations of the earth. 
And then Tiamat, you know, has a showdown with the god named Marduk. You might remember something like that, right? And Marduk, what does he do? He commands the winds to enter Tiamat's mouth and her belly puffs up. And then because he's an awesome warrior, he splits her in half with an arrow. Yeah, that's emphasis is a cool point for the kids. Hudson's guy, yeah, get excited over there. And he splits her in half with an arrow. And with one half of the body uh, of the God, the, the heavens are created. The other half, the earth is created, right? That's the cultural account of Genesis. They say, look at the similarities, Tiamat and the deep. And yeah, look at how different the stories are. See, Genesis paints this unique picture of creation. Utterly unique in the world at that point. I would say even still, where the world was made without struggle and conflict. It's not born of a war between gods. Genesis, the world and universe comes into existence because Elohim, God, just spoke it into being. No war, no conflict, no battle. God is unrivaled and unparalleled in his power. And he's at peace. And he creates everything out of the joy and delight his creation would bring him. That's a good message. And that's a different message. You see, the Hebrews understand rightly that the world was at peace. It is broken now, but it will be at peace again. And other religions, because they're basing their religion off of demonic influence or, or what they can observe in the universe, see, man, the world is at chaos. Not only are people in chaos, but the very essence of nature seems to be at chaos. We get the floods and the tornadoes and the hurricanes and the earthquakes. And so because the chaos and the conflict happens beyond the realm of humans, therefore the chaos and the battle and the, must happen beyond the realm of humans. The gods must be at war to create the world that it is. And so the world must have been born in conflict. And it continues in conflict and chaos. And it will never change. That's the worldview for the world apart from Christ. You see the difference? What's put inside, the hum inside of us, church, is an unquenchable hope to say the world will not always be this way. And what's put inside of us, church, because of the creation account and its distinctiveness, that we can look at the world and say, that is not right, that is not okay, and I will not just get used to it and accept it or let, or let what is broken become normal. Because the world wasn't made to be this way, and the world won't stay this way. This is but a brief moment of history where we struggle and have pain. Amen? God said, let there be light, and there was light, so the light was good. Notice how Genesis describes God's power here. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He made a couple of statements makes the universe and everything in it. And you notice how the scripture seems to respond, how, how the scripture seems to describe how creation responds to God. Now, here it is, right? God said, let there be light, and there was light. Boy, it seems like Creation responds immediately, completely, and without complaint. God spoke and it happened. Right away, all the way, cheerful way. That's how the very atoms and the energy of the universe come into being, right? And organize himself. Because God spoke and it obeyed right away, all the way, cheerful way. And God declared that that was good. Church, do you realize that God, and the, the, if you've been around for a while, you've heard me use that phrase, and if you know where I'm going with this one is that uh, God still speaks today. He still speaks commands today. You got them in your hand, right? He gives you lots of instructions in the scriptures. And can I ask you, do you respond to God right away, all the way, a cheerful way? That's his expectation for us. It's, it's what the very atoms of the universe does. Are we going to say that the atoms of the universe actually respond to God more faithfully than we do? That the rocks are actually more faithful to God than we are? I don't know about you, but I think it can beat a rock most of the time. They're pretty hard competition. One of the greatest kids, one of the greatest, greatest gifts you can give your kids in the next generation is modeling for them right away, all the way, cheerful obedience to God. Reflect nature in that. Reflect what God intended in that. And then to teach you, the next generation to obey proper authority right away, all the way, cheerful way. It's God's expectation for us. It's what we should pass on. Because again, that's when God declares things good. 
All right. So we've centered on the creator, God, who has unrivaled dominance over creation, who separated light from darkness, putting both in their places. And our God did all this by the simple commands, let there be. Day one. Now, again, that was the longest part. We're going to bump forward here. God said, so let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. Uh, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Now, I highlight this word expanse. That's a big one. There's a lot of theology that gets hung on this word expanse. And uh, because NIV translates it vault, NRSV dome, NLT a space, the New King James or ERV translates it firmament. And uh, this is poetically described elsewhere as a tent curtain in Psalm 104.2, a veil in Isaiah 40.22, a clear pavement like, like sapphire in Exodus 24.10, and molten glass, Job 37.18. And we're not going to say much about it here, but I want to put this as a teaser for you. When we get to Noah and the flood, this idea of expanse or firmament is going to come back in in a greater way. Uh, scholars will often use this to, to, as a key idea in, in what causes a global flood. just want to point that out to you. Now, the third day, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plant yielding seeds for fruit, for food. Plant yielding seed and fruit trees bearing much fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so, the third day. I'm skipping a little bit there for the sake of time. Now what we see here for the creation account so far is a kind of a rhythm and a pattern, right? God spends three days forming, and then he spends three days filling. Right? And there's a correlation. So day one, the light and dark, and then he fills it. He forms the sea and the sky, and then he gives creatures for it. He forms the fertile earth, and then he fills the fertile earth. God forms and fills, and again, he tasks us to do something very similar. And I think that's a beautiful thing, that God loves to create life, and he loves to fill. I just, you know, we didn't get into this part in terms of the creation account, but there's so much good data out there. Um, mathematically, like, probable or proven that the universe is fine-tuned, that the earth is special, because even though there's millions and millions of stars in the sky, the amount of specific factors that have to come into play to produce life on earth, you know, type of sun, distance from sun, rotation of the earth, tilt of the earth, a, a, a moon type star to get a, a moon structure to help do what it needs to do, and over and over and over again, the, God fine-tunes creation in a specific way so there would be life. God loves there to be life. He forms and he fills with life. We're going to talk about that more when it comes to be fruitful. And so if you read carefully the text, you'll see that every day he says is, by the way, typo that one, my bad. Every day he says that um, it is good, but he only blesses two days, five and six. Five and six. The only times when God blesses is in five and six. Because his blessing produces fertility. He's blessing to produce fertility in life. Now, I, I know some of us struggle with fertility in the congregation. Don't think for a moment they're not blessed by God. Sin has corrupted this, um, the blessing of fertility. And, but what, and what we're talking about here is really the species level or the macro level of fertility, not the individual experience of it. See, what I find awesome is that God created, at the very beginning, the universe to have life, to be fertile. And the earth has made was made with so much capacity to produce life. I mean, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, but, you know, we thought, like, when the earth had maybe a billion people that, oh, my gosh, we can't sustain any more people. Like, we're, like, fill the earth up. It's, we've reached the maximum of its fertility. We're just going to cross 8 billion people, and we have enough food to feed everybody. It's just a matter of location, right? We're just getting it where it needs to go. God created the world, though, to produce life and to be fertile and to continue it without his ongoing creative command. God created natural processes in place so that the earth would be fertile. And again, that's a very like modern understanding, but it's what we see here in Genesis. God blessed it, and it happens. And the reason why life continues to happen is because he blessed it then. and said, be fertile. His blessings from thousands of years ago sustain. You know, God has his hand in it all, but what, God, what the Christian says in terms of God having his hand and the ongoing of creation is radically different than the other religions. Let me tell you a minute about Baal, because I want you to see how distinct Genesis is. Baal, again, that's a, the Canaan god, and you see the Israelites getting in a lot of trouble with that god, Baal. Now, did anybody know what Baal is the god of? Water? Uh, kind of, yes. He's a fertility god, and he has, some, he has some interaction with water. Yes, he does. Good, good. 
See, Baal's the fertility god. Baal's the one that made things fertile, which is why the, you know, the Israelites want to go back and worship Baal. Like, hey, God, bring us your fertility blessing when it's already been given. Here's the myth, right? Here's the religion. Baal produced fertility. At the end of the year, Baal died. Well, that's some kind of God for you. An idea, that idea explained why the crops died. Baal died, crops died. And it was said, and then Baal would be captured by the, uh, the death god named Mot and carried away into the abyss, the ocean, to be captured by Prince C. So he would be, he'd die, he'd go into the oceans because he was captured. But in the springtime, his chick, uh, Anat, would rescue him in a bloody battle. By the way, you know with Tiamat and with this one, like the guy's helpless? I mean, I tell you what, women have to, anyways. Sorry, that's an off-the-cuff observation there. Demasculizing men even then. That's why we need good men's ministry. All right. Um, Mott would carry him away into the abyss. Anat would come, rescue him in a bloody battle, bring him to the surface again. He would be born again, and that's why your crops would grow, right? That's the myth. That's how people understood the world to work. Crops died because our God died for the winter time. We better pray and sacrifice it. Anat, make sure you go and make it happen again because, you know, we really need crops in the spring and the crops don't come. Oh, Anat must not have won the battle yet. We've got to sacrifice more. Right? You see, you see how all of a sudden they become slaves to the natural forces. They have to appease these gods, the ongoing gods, to provide blessings. And the Christian says, no, God created it. He blessed it to be fertile. And he set up the natural processes for it to continue to do so. Anyways. All right. And the fourth day, I won't read it all. God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Um, what, what, I, what I want to point out to you on this fourth day is when it talks about light, it talks about it from a certain perspective, and it's called the phenomenological. That's a fun word. You can say it with me. Phenomenological. Yeah. Oh, good job, Caroline. You can hardly, yeah. And what that means is it's describing it from the phenomenal, from the, uh, as if it's a phenomenon from the perspective of a human being. Like, what do we experience? What's the phenomenon we would see? Again, so there's this not trying to declare a scientific view of this, as we would understand it. It's not giving us the, hey, you're in the middle of the universe talking about the light. It's saying, as a human being, what do we experience? What phenomenon is ours? And one of the fun parts about that, not only to help you to interpret it rightly, but the way God describes creation account is from our perspective. And it kind of tips his hand that we are, we're kind of the big deal. Like the earth is a, is a big deal. Human beings are a big deal. We're like the center of the story. And the sun exists to give light to the earth. Like because he made these things to bless us and to care for us. By the way, you notice, what does he call the sun and the moon in the scriptures there? The greater and lesser light. And I, I, I want to note to you, again, a uniqueness and distinction of Scripture is that that's what he calls them. He, he doesn't really give them a name. It's just the greater and lesser light. Remember, every other religion around them would name their sun, right? Name the sun, name the stars. The Egyptian god of the sun is Ra, right? And it's the great light. It's Ra, and he's the god of gods. We're going to worship the sun. God's like, no, it's just the greater and lesser light. It's there to give you day and night. They're not worthy of worship. I'm worthy of worship. From the very beginning, the Jews were distinctly different because they got revelation from God that, look, don't worship the sun and the moon. They're just rocks and gas. Worship the one who's above it all. No, oh, thank you for that one. All right, fifth day. And go, clicker, go. And can you, uh, Gary, bear me out, bail me out there. I got a delay here. Uh-oh, frozen. Yeah. Got to love technology and software. All right, freestyle time. Woo. He says, let the waters swarm with the, with a swarm and swarm with living creatures. So he fills up the waters. And the phrase I want to point out to you there is, he, you see, he calls them the great creatures of the sea. The great creatures of the sea. And this is, a, this again, a fascinating thing. Um, the great creatures of the sea are called tannin. That's the Hebrew word there. And they're the mysterious monsters. And these, guys, these monsters brought fear to the nations. Like the tan and the great creatures of the sea makes a sailor quake in his boots. But in fact, it, it, it's been a part of our like, imagination and in a fearful way even till recently, right? Think of the books Moby Dick or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, right? The great monsters of the deep and the epic struggle against these things. And in fact, these, the tan and the great monsters of the deep were so big and fearsome, they were a test of godhood. In the ancient times. What do I mean by that? 
You, you knew you were a god and worthy of worship when you could defeat the tannin. If you were big enough to combat the tannin, the great creatures of the sea, then you were God. That's a common in Canaan. Stories were told of how the gods fought with dragons and sea serpents, and thereby they just demonstrated their worthiness to rule the heavens. And against that, God scoffs. He's like, I created the great creatures of the sea. And in fact, uh, the word tannin there, he, he goes on, God in other parts of the scripture says that the Leviathan in God's eyes is only a fish to be hooked or a pet for amusement, Job 41. The psalmist calls upon these creatures to recognize and praise their creator. So again, you have these forces, right? The sun that's worthy of worship by a lot of people. No, the natural world that must have gods that we, you know, that are causing fertility. No, the great creatures of the sea that are so awesome that our gods have to struggle to defeat them to be worthy of praise. No, God is above them all. The greatest, most fearful things in creation are simply a fish to be hooked at your God's leisure point with this one church and young kids especially there's nothing big or small in creation that's not under god's sovereign power or authority there's no creature you need to fear god is more powerful than anything that might cause you harm or cause you fright god is bigger than what we often give him credit for and look you know if you're like well i don't muster of any animals yeah you know good job being a grown-up adult um but we can slip into the same type of thinking when it comes to, we just replace the tannin. We replace it with spiritual forces that we get in fear of. We replace it with groups of people or institutions. Oh my gosh, this group of people are so scary. We can become in fear of something lesser than tannin, just a bunch of human beings getting together trying to get their way with something. Church, there's nothing in creation. No creature of the deep, no mythical monster, no spiritual force, no group of human beings that you need to fear. They're all petty before the Lord. Nothing to be frightened of. Now, should we, do we need to be respectful of the various dangers we face? Absolutely. But frightened? No. Don't disregard caution, but don't live in fear. God is bigger than everything and anything. Still frozen, Gear Bear? All right. And God still let the earth, and they, on the sixth day, God still let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock according to their kinds. I just want to point out on that sixth day, God creates, I don't matter, I'm not going to hide it. And God created them according to their kinds. Again, God created ordered creation. He doesn't seem to speak of evolution, but intentional creation. And then the very last phrase I want to point out to you there is what's repeated often and always in Genesis is that he declared that it was good. The very thing I wanted to point out to you is that he declared it good. When creation is aligned to God's will and purpose, it is good. And the earth didn't spawn in conflict. It's not going to remain in conflict forever. The earth is not inherently evil. It is good. It is good. So let me give you a couple takeaways here. Let me give you two application points before we jump into communion. First, and this is, this is going to be the simplest application point I'll probably ever give you. Well, uh, okay, I got another simple one coming up. But... In a couple weeks. But first, the first application point for you is, is uh, when you go out the door today, just look. Like, go, go look at some nature today. Go observe what's around you today. And be in awe of the fact that God made it all. Like, by the word of his mouth, he's bigger than it. He's over top of it. Be in awe. And if you're really, you know, if you're really an indoor person like me, just look up some pictures of nature on your phone. <laughs> Have a fresh wonder at God's goodness. Don't worship the creation, but worship the God and praise the God who created it all. All that big and beauty is made by a few simple statements of God. And the second application point is don't despair. Church, God is good, and he made things good. And he's more powerful than anything that there is and ever will be. And he's going to make it good again. And that can give us hope. That can give us confidence. So don't despair. I know we go through difficult, hard times now. Don't despair it. And don't grow complacent. I think, what's one of the fears that I have for myself as I grow older? Like, how do I not grow calloused? How do I stay soft before the Lord? How, how do, and one of the things I respect about my brothers and sisters in the faith who have lived, you know, 30 years longer than me, and who have a soft heart before the Lord, who haven't grown complacent with the brokenness of the world, who haven't just grown calloused, don't, don't go down that road. Learn from those who have done this well. Church, it is not supposed to be this way. 
and don't get used to it being this way. God wants to do something good in us and through us. Elders, would you come forward to help with communion? See, God, that God created the world good is a part of the gospel that we hold on to, right? He created it to be good. And the fact that we are here today is a recognition that God is good and he created things good.